so grateful that you are good or that we can trust you. God, that you have shown that you do great things, that your promises are true. As we sing about your faithfulness this morning, I pray that we find a peace in our souls, a rest in our hearts, Lord, that you are working always, that we can look to you always, or that you are only a thought away, or you are so close, closer than our next breath. May we find just, just a comfort in you being around us right now.
grateful that you're here. sing a new song for us this morning, but um, the message is not hopefully new to us. It's about God's faithfulness, which we've already touched on this morning and praise him for. Um, but the idea of his promises through the ages and the times that we read in our, in our Bibles and scripture, how he was faithful to his people and how because of Christ, we are now among his people. We are descendants of Abraham because of the fulfillment that Christ brought by his death and resurrection. And so just seeing of that faithfulness and knowing that he remains steadfast in the midst of the storms, in the midst of the winds blowing around, um, metaphorically, but he is present and we're grateful for that. So let's praise him for his, his faithfulness this morning. God of Abraham, God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may
thank you so much for that faithfulness. And it's not just for me in my little bubble. That's for us, the church. I want to sing that chorus again and make it plural. We're singing that together about his faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness to us. Great is your faithfulness. As a church that you are present, that you are good, that you are leading, that you speak over us. God, I pray today that we would be listening for your spirit. God, we'd be listening for your calling. And Lord, we would just dedicate each day to praise you. Lord, when the winds come, when the storms come, we still praise because it's a beautiful day and it's a new morning and your mercies are new and sufficient. God, we praise you for your great faithfulness, for your mercy and grace that is poured out upon us daily that we don't deserve. It is given freely already and we just need to accept it and live in freedom within it. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time to be able to worship you together in your son's holy, holy name. Amen. Again, it's great to see everyone. Welcome to everybody who's watching online. It's awesome that we were able to gather in this way. And um, just want to remind you that... Um, that we're going to be kind of working in this format until we're told differently, uh, just following whatever the guidelines of the CDC and the city are. And um, grateful that the church can gather. Ga- grateful that the church can worship. Um, grateful that we're not persecuted within that. We are more fortunate than we realize. And so to be able to do this in whatever way that people are comfortable with everything going on, we're just glad that you're here. Uh, whether you're sitting here or watching wherever you're at, um, and so we praise God that the, the body can gather. Uh, if this is your first time with us, uh, New Life Lincoln Park is part of New Life Community Church. Um, one church, one huge church family across the city of Chicago that just meets in different places. And so we're gr- so grateful for um, what God is doing in his church throughout the Chicagoland area and around the world. But grateful for how we get to be a part of that in this community and this part of the city. Um, and so we're really glad that you're here. Uh, if this is your first time with us, um, one of the things is we're not, we don't have our typical connection cards in the pews or passing out bulletins and things like that. So if you go to, um, if you text this number here, the text the word welcome, if you're new with us, then we'll be able to just connect with you in that way, get your name and email address, and we'd love to be able to know how to pray for you. I'd love to be able to send you a note just thanking you for joining us. Um, another thing we want to encourage you to do is that if you go into your, whatever your phone operating uh, app store is look for new life chicago you'll see our little uh leaf in there and uh, once you get into the app if you go to locations and then go to lincoln park uh, that's where how we're communicating so our app our bulletin is in there Um, and so all the different information about events that are coming up things that are happening and so please if you haven't already downloaded that make sure you check it out Um, and you can also whether you um, want to give through the app or online um, if this is your first time with us, don't worry about this, but if Ch- New Life Lincoln Park is your home, if you want to worship through giving in that way, you can do it, um, again, through the app or th- online as well. Uh, before we get into our message, I have a couple important announcements for everybody. One is that tonight we're doing a night to connect. Um, we, it's one of the things about, obviously everybody knows within this season and in this, the pandemic and all the different impact that it's had, is it's, we haven't seen one another 
and it's been hard to connect in that way. And there can be drift within that. And so we want to be really intentional about being able to get together, uh, to be able to get together in smaller groups, but also to be able to meet as a church family. And that's really what tonight is about. And I know that it is nice out. It'd be great to go and do this outside. And we are planning on doing some of those. But we have a lot of people in our church that are still um, students who aren't back to the city yet. And we want them to be able to participate and others who are traveling. So just understand why we didn't do it outside this time. We want to make sure people are able to connect um, wherever they're at. And so tonight at 7 o'clock, if you go to the church's um, Facebook page, you'll see the event there. You do have to reserve a spot so that we can um, get the, the Zoom link to you. Um, if you're not uh, somebody that uses Facebook, if you text, the, your text to that number that you want the information about tonight, uh, then we can get that for you as well. But I just really encourage you to be there. It's really just going to be about being together, praying together. Uh, and right now, we really need that um, just with everything that's happening and going back to school and things that are happening in our city and our, our world. Um, it'll be great to see one another, to, to connect with one another, and pray to one another. So that's tonight at 7. Um, the following weekend, the 16th, we're doing an all-church play date. Um, this is the play date for all ages. And so we wanted it, we, we're calling it the all church, all ages play date because we want, don't want this to seem like if you don't have kids and you don't have little ones, you can't be there. We want everybody to be able to come in and hang out for a little bit. So there's a church on the north side in Edgewater we're going to be getting going to. It's right off the Berwyn stop. Uh, we'll have some snacks and stuff like that. So just be able to come and hang out and see one another there at the church. And so you're never too old, too uh, you're never too old to get into the splash pad or the sprinklers there. So uh, come and hang out and see others from the church that Sunday. Um, and then the last two things. One is that um, two of our missionaries, Mark and Josie Kondra, who are in Southeast Asia, they've been part of this church for a long time. Um, I think almost as, even as long as I've been here. And uh, they've been overseas for the last uh, two years. And uh, we have an update from them that they sh they're sharing with us. So we want to show you that video. Hey everybody, it's Mark and Josie, and we're so excited to be seeing you all the way from Asia. So due to COVID, of course, everybody's plans have changed throughout the world, and uh, we are no exception to that. Uh, our plans have changed this year, and unfortunately we're not allowed to be in the village right now, so we are once again in the capital city, but our work is continuing here. Yeah, the lockdown here ended after 120 days, but... Um, there's just little plan moving forward. So we're just staying here and lying low until things in the country open back up and it's determined uh, safe for us to be back out in the more remote area. So during this time, we're thankful to be in the capital and have Wi-Fi. Of course, that makes life a lot easier and that's enabled us to stay in touch with some of our friends who are out in the village. Um, they're also going through a really difficult time right now through the monsoon season rains it's causing a lot of landslides, roads are being blocked, you know, houses are being affected. So the mix of COVID and the monsoon crises have led to different relief opportunities. And we really look forward to coming back to the States next year and sharing with you guys more about these opportunities where the Lord has just moved in these times of need. So while we're here in the city, this allows us to do um, some of our more uh, detailed linguistic analysis work. things, And this is uh, the language that we're now learning is a tonal language and it's it's really it's been a challenge and anyway so we're using different software and things to analyze that tone and really make sure we understand things and it's kind of like if you pick the english word banana and just say it 20 times after the 21st time it starts to sound really weird so this is the same thing with this language the more we listen to it the more i think i'm hearing things so <laughs> We designate just a few hours each day to kind of devote to this language study and that enables us to come each day with a fresh mind and fresh perspective and really open our ears to hear the different nuances and tones of the language. So thank you for uh, your just continued partnership and prayer for us. We're hoping to be able to return to the village um, in the next few months. One thing that we've just been learning and dwelling on this year is that um, God is good in the waiting. And I don't know what that goodness looks like for you, uh, it definitely looks different than what I thought it would look like for us, but um, he's still good and he's still faithful, and that's a truth that we can just rest in. Uh, 
Um, it's awesome to be able to just connect with them in that way. I think last this past January or February, we were able to talk with them live in Zoom, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that in the next couple months as well. Uh, but it's great to just hear what God is doing with them in Southeast Asia. It's awesome to see that after three or four years of effort that Mark's beard is finally coming in. Um, uh, he's not here to defend himself, but we'll let that lie. Um, but we want to be praying for them. Uh, we'll pray for them in a second. The other thing we want to just make sure that we're in prayer about is everything that's happened in Lebanon uh, this last week. If we think about the explosion that's happened in Beirut. Um, I th we hear about this. We watch the video. I'm sure you've uh, seen it. And if not, you, know, just, you can Google that and find it. And you see the explosion, and it's, it's hard to get your mind around I mean, we've seen, you know, 9-11, we've seen things in our own country, but not having a familiarity with that city, it's hard to get our minds around the destruction that's happened. And so this picture that somebody made showing us what the explosion would have been like if it would have happened in Chicago really puts it in perspective, at least for me, and hopefully for you, of what that explosion was like. The, this is as if the explosion happened at Navy Pier, and you can see that the destruction would have been it pretty much would have decimated the entire city. And so this is what's happened in Beirut. Uh, our own uh, Alexandra Ewing, she has family that live in Beirut, and we're really grateful that they're okay. Um, they uh, weren't injured or anything, but uh, her cousin has two friends that did die in the blast. And so this is connected to our church family. And along with the different things that are happening in the city politically and corruption and different protests that are happening um, on top of COVID. Uh, it, to say that this city is struggling would be the understatement of the century and probably a little bit of last century as well. And so we really wanna be praying for the people there and um, those who are coming alongside and um, the real life stories of how this is affecting people. And so as we do that, let's pray for Lebanon, let's pray for Mark and Josie and pray that God would speak to us as we get into our message this morning. God, we do praise you and we're grateful that you are sovereign, that you're in control, that you are a good, just God, that you love us beyond what we can comprehend. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to be in relationship with you, to be part of your community. And so we're grateful for what you're doing. We're grateful for how you connect us. We're grateful for how you're working and that you haven't stopped working even as things are just full of unknowns and difficulty. And I pray that you would encourage us with that this morning. We're grateful for what you're doing in Mark and Josie Condra's life and the missions and how you've called them and blessed them and provided for them and protect them. And we pray that you would do all of that as well. We think about the struggles that they've had over the last year and we thank you that you've sustained them and brought people alongside them. And we just pray that you would give them a reminder of your love for them and that they're not alone. God, we pray for everything that's happening in Beirut, for the losses, for the pain, the, the rebuilding, God, the tension, the, the upheaval. We just pray, God, that you would intervene. We pray that people would come alongside others, that countries would come alongside them, that you would even provide opportunities for us to come alongside, God. But we pray that you would, you would provide, that you would move in the church to come alongside the city and show them the love of Jesus tangibly, God, within their need. God, we pray for, um, as we get into the message today, we pray, God, that you would let us see our words, that you would help us to be mindful of how we speak, that you would help us to be mindful of the power of our words and how we talk to one another and others outside of this place, that we would be showing them your love through how we communicate. And we just pray that in all, all these things in your name, amen. Uh, so we're going to be looking at only one verse today. I mean, we're going to jump around a little bit, but we're going to focus on one verse today, and it's Ephesians 4.29. So if you want to click to that or turn to that, whatever you're using for your Bible this morning. But while you're doing that, we are in the middle of a series called Spark, The Power of Our Words how we use our words. The author and priest, uh, Henry Nowen, a uh, very amazing author, I uh, highly recommend any of his books, but he once said this about the power of our words. 
Words, words, words. Our society is full of words. On billboards, on television screens, in newspapers and books. Words whispered, shouted, and sung. Words that move and dance and change in size and color. Words that say, taste me, smell me, eat me, drink me, sleep with me, but most of all, buy me. With so many words around us, we quickly say, well, they're just words. Thus, words have lost much of their power. Still, the word has the power to create. When God speaks, God creates. When God says, let there be light, light is. God speaks light. For God, speaking and creating are the same. It is the creative power of the word we need to reclaim. It is the power, creative power of the word that we need to reclaim. What we say is very important. When we say, I love you, and say it from the heart, we can give another person new life, new hope, new courage. When we say, I hate you, we can destroy another person. Let's watch our words. And this paragraph gets to the heart of what this series is about. Words have an amazing power that we have to take responsibility for. We have to watch our words. And we're, as I said, we're going to look at Ephesians 4.29 to get to this a little, to take this further today. For, time, for context of what we're getting at and how this verse fits in within the letter of Ephesians, one of the early church leaders, Paul, wrote this letter and um, earlier in the letter, in chapter 4, verse 1, he says this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. I urge you, beg you, please, live a life worthy of the life you have been called to. For the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul talked about everything that God did to make it possible for people to enter into relationship with him because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Now, he tells us, this life that God called you to, this life that God made happen, live worthy of it. Live in such a way that matches the life that you have been given, that honors the life that you have been given from God. And so in the last three chapters of Ephesians, from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the letter, Paul talks about if the first three chapters are how you were given that life, the last three chapters are, here's what it looks like to live that life. The last three chapters of Ephesians say, here's how you live worthy. And chapter 4, 29, that we're looking at this morning is part of that. How we use our words in a worthy manner. Verse 29 says, Do not let un any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. To live a worthy life means using worthy words. Let me say that again. To, you, to live a worthy life means using worthy words. And that's what we need to talk about this morning. That worthy words are ones that build people up. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for, helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This verse gives us three things to consider and how to use the spark that we have, the words that we're given in a worthy manner. The first thing it tells us is that walking worthy is choosing to not serve up rotten words. To walk worthy, to use worthy words, is to choose to not serve up rotten words. He says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That idea of unwholesome here has a specific emphasis on doing harm to other people. 
that we can do harm to other people with our words. And to grasp the idea of what the word is talking about, I want you to specifically think of fresh fruit. Now, if we have fruit, fruit that is fresh, that is ripe, it's delicious, it's good for us. Some of us probably need a little bit more fruit in our diets and such. But that, that just looks good on a summer day, right? It's ripe, it's healthy, it's good for us. But imagine seeing a bowl full of rotten fruit, of being served some spoiled, moldy fruit, and then taking a bite of one of those. Now, the thing about the mask is that we can't see, I, I, can't, I don't like not being able to see people smile, but I could tell by a lot of your eyes that what was going on in your face was, ooh, like that kind of a thing. Because to eat something like this, it would do us harm. It would make us sick. You would probably take one bite of any of those and be gagging or puking within seconds, right? The idea of unwholesome here is rotten. When we speak unwholesome words to somebody, this is the picture we need to have. We are force-feeding them words that will make them sick and do them harm. We are force-feeding them words like that. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the hand of the tongue. Those who give themselves to eat it, eat it to, to it, eat its fruit. We cannot speak words that are rotten. We have to speak words that are healthy and give life. And what exactly are rotten words? How do we know we're speaking rotten, unwholesome words? Well, there's other passages that talk about this. Colossians 3, 8 says, You must put, away, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Ephesians 5, later in Ephesians, he says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are all out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. These get to the heart of what is rotten. To talk in a slanderous way are rotten words about others, about the community. How do we talk about others when they're not around? How do we talk about others when they're not present? Are they, how we talk about the church family, how we talk about coworkers, classmates, neighbors, do you talk about people in a rotten way? Slander can destroy the community. Obscene and foolish talk are rotten words which can destroy a testimony. Does someone who says they have love Jesus, do they have that kind of language coming out of their mouth? Those kind of jokes coming out of their mouth? Those kind of flippant comments coming out of their mouth? People can look at what's coming out of our mouth and it can rotten, destroy their perception of what Jesus is like. We can't allow this rottenness out of our mouths. Proverbs 12, 18 says, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15, 4 says, The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. How you and I talk to people has to be in a way that's healthy, that gives life, that brings healing. We can't crush people with our words. The way that we say something, does it crush somebody's spirit? That doesn't mean that we don't say difficult things. That doesn't mean that we don't confront difficult things. That, means we don't, that doesn't mean we don't have to deal with things, but there's a way that we can do it. Do we talk to people, address situations, talk about people in a way that's rotten? We need to step back and evaluate if we're walking worthy with our words. So walking worthy is choosing not to serve up rotten words, which leads to the second thing, walking worthy is choosing to use words that build up. 
what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Don't use the rotten words. Instead, build people up. Edify people. Now, a lot of images come to mind when I think of building someone up. The coach giving his team a pep talk before the big game, motivating them to do their best and to win. The parent comforting their kid after a really bad day, reminding them that they're loved. The friend sticking up for you when everybody else is putting you down. The boss giving positive feedback after a job well done. The teacher sharing how well they see you doing in your goals and what's ahead for you. They're all more than just good jobs and gold stars and check boxes and things like that. There are moments when somebody is speaking not just to you, but into you. They're speaking into you, letting you see the truth of who you are, how how much better you can become and that you want to be. Proverbs 10.21 says, The lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. And so here's the key. If rotten words, unwholesome words, cause ruin and destruction, affirming words, worthy words that build up, nourish somebody else's soul. The way we talk, the words we use, feed their soul in a healthy way. And I don't say that all in a hallmark, warm, fuzzy way. Worthy words, words that nourish the soul are rooted in the reality of the gospel. Because what do words that build up do? They point to what is true about God and who we are in him and his love for us. Words that build up strengthen us when we're weak because of the reality of who God is, his promises and what he says to us in his word. Words that build up give us hope when we are concerned or fearful, reminding us there is more than just the difficult unknown moment, but we have hope in the reality of who God is and what he's doing. Words that build up remind us that we're not alone, but that we are part of something. We are part of of the body of Christ, words that build up, nourish our soul because they're rooted in the truth of the gospel. Building somebody up with words is an opportunity to remind the Jesus follower of who they are in Christ, who they are in the body, and that our future hope is secure. But using words that build others up is also an opportunity to show the person who's checking Jesus out what he's like. And what this life he's offering is like. To choose building up words is of utmost importance. When we think of using words to build others up, a complimentary passage to this in Ephesians is Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit are doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. There's a couple things in here where it says building each other up with words is spurring others on. Spurring somebody on is provoking them. Not provoking them to anger, not provoking them to get a rise out of them, but how do I provoke somebody that they're going to experience love? How do I provoke somebody that they're going to want to do good things? It's really kind of a military term of saying, come on, let's keep going. Let's go after it. The victory's ahead. It's reminding people, don't give up. Keep going. And so if we're supposed to spur one another on in a, with our words, how can I say what needs to be said in such a way that people will know they're loved and they'll want to do good? They'll want to keep going they'll want to not give up. That's building up somebody with our words. He says building each other up with words is encouraging. We need to be encouraging people. It's comfort that's rooted in the gospel. To encourage somebody is to remind them that they're a child of God, to give them hope, to remind them that they're loved, to fill that empty tank. How can I say this in such a way that their empty tank is filled with the truth of Jesus. Not to beat them up, but to fill them up with what's true. And then building each other up happens when we're connected, this passage tells us. 
There has to be an intentional effort to enter community. We cannot build one another up with our words if we're not with one another. And there is a very important warning for us in this passage. Don't give, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. We have to make sure that our connecting with the church family becomes a habit and that the habit we develop is not how less do I connect. We, it's what, our connection with the church family, I'm not just talking about perfect attendance. I'm talking about connecting with one another, building relationships, and walking through life with one another. Not that we're going to know every single person in the room or online, but we have some type of connections with this place. To not be connected to that has to be the every once in a while life happened that I couldn't be there. That is understandable. But if we're part of the family of God, I show up every once in a while is not how it should be. The habit that we should have is that we're here, we're connected, we're encouraging one another, we're spurring one another on, because there's times when we need people to speak into our lives, whether we want it or admit it or not. And the truth is, other people need us to be doing that. And we can't downplay our role in other people's lives. People too quickly abandon communities of faith under the guise of, I'm not growing, or I feel like God's leading me here, or I've prayed about it. And we use these spiritual catchphrases to blanket the fact that I just really don't want to put the effort out to be connected. It's easier to just to go and sit someplace else where no one knows me than it is to actually put in the effort in the place where God has me. It's easier to put a move and go on than to deal with what is happening in a place. And God has called us to be part of community, not just to sit around community. And so people need you to spur them on. People need you to encourage them. And don't sell yourself short. If you have a relationship with Jesus, he has gifted you and empowered you. He wants to use you to spur other people on and encourage them as well. We need one another. We need to build one another up. And typically, we think about this, these, these passages and thinking like this when a person's down. When a person's down, we have to build them up. And that's true. But we should be using words that build people up all the time. Regardless if somebody's down or there's a problem, all of our speech should be building one another up. Even in the smallest of circumstances, we can choose, it's the mundane moments of life. It's the mundane moments of conversation. Do I use my words in those moments in a way that builds up, that spurs on, that encourages, that points to Jesus? Because that's what we're called to do. How can I say this in such a way that nourishes this person's soul, that builds up who they are, that they can experience Jesus? Are you using your words to nourish people, to build them up? So walking worthy is choosing not to use rotten words. Walking worthy is choosing to use words that build up. And the last thing, is that walking worthy is choosing to be a servant with your words. And this is intricately connected to the last point, but there needs, this needs to be emphasized, that it may, it may benefit those who listen. It's a good reminder here at the end that when we speak, when we respond, when we use worthy words, when we nourish and build up with our words, we're trying to build up the other person not ourselves. And really, we can only build the other person up if we've heard them, if we've understood them, if we've grasped what they've said. For my words to benefit the person I'm speaking to, I have to understand what they need. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, we must learn to regard people less in light of what they do or admit to do in more in light of what they suffer. 
And that's the thing, is we don't typically speak to somebody about what they're experiencing. We speak from a place of reacting to what they are experiencing. And then it's more about us and not about them. It's, this is the check that we need to do with our words. Am I saying this based on how I feel about the moment, the situation, the conflict, or whatever it is? Or am I saying this based on how they're feeling? Am I saying this, am I choosing to use these words based on my reaction to the moment or based on their experience in the moment? This is not to say that we don't have our own feelings. It doesn't say that we don't talk about these things, that we can't communicate. We need to have those conversations. But remember what the topic at hand is. Building people up nourishing somebody's soul. If I am being a servant, trying to speak for someone's benefit, then I have to speak in a way that nourishes and cares for their soul and not simply take care of mine. When James says, we read this last week, when James says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, Those first two things especially, quick to listen and slow to speak, it's not just about when there's conflict. We should be quick to listen and slow to speak all the time. In in TV, there's broadcast delay. There's a a delay that happens, and all-knowing Wikipedia explains it like this. It's an intentional delay when broadcasting live material. Such a delay may be to prevent mistakes or unacceptable content from being broadcast. And so it's a five, seven, ten second delay where it's live, but they're going to hold it back ten seconds because if something stupid happens or bad happens or inappropriate, they can cut it off. What James is telling us is that we need to have a talking delay. Go slow, stop, and take a breath and think about what you're going to say so that it's not just about you, but it's about nourishing and building up and for the other's benefit. Make sure your words serve. And a couple of things that we have to think about to make that happen are, do I understand what this person is saying? Do I understand what they're going through? Do I understand what's really happening here? Do I understand the thing underneath the thing? Not just the reaction or what's pouring out, but what's going on inside them, what they're suffering, as Bonhoeffer says. And based on that, how do I speak in a way that will nourish them? The next time you're in conversation with somebody, remember to build them up. Remember to think, what do they need right now? Not in a pandering way, but in building them up, in nourishing their soul, in reminding them of what's true. How do I speak to that? Because if I'm trying to build them up, then what I'm going to say is benefit them. It's not just going to be my reaction to it, because my reaction might completely miss the point, and they walk away still hurting and suffering. Choose to be a servant with your words. Choose to build others up. Choose to not serve up rotten words. Eugene Peterson says this to close. At the center of our lives were God and the human, faith and the absurd, love and indifference are tangled in daily traffic jams. The language in which we must become proficient is the language of personal relationship. Getting as much of our language as possible into the speech of love and mercy and intimacy, saying, Abba, Daddy, Father. What's he saying? In every aspect of our life, we have to get proficient in speaking in a way that reflects the person and love of God. And so when you think about how you talk, when you think about how you've talked to people, when you think about how you have talked about people, who is somebody that comes to mind that you can encourage with your words? And here's how it works. Whatever person came to mind right now when I said that, that's the person. 
Who is somebody that you have spoken to in a way that you might have been right, but how you went about it was wrong? Who do you need to apologize and make amends with? Whoever came to mind, that's the person. Who is the person that you have been talking in a rotten way when they're not around? That you might need to go and apologize. Who, can, who is somebody that you can just affirm and with thanksgiving say, I'm so grateful. I see you and who you are and what you do. And I just want you to know I appreciate it. Whoever it is, is the person. We need to build up others with our words and we need to be proficient in how we talk. And when we fail, which every single one of us is going to do, we need to make that right. As we think about how we talk, how we love, how we become proficient in the language of God's love, we're going to end service today with communion. Nothing can help remind us better how to talk than to remind ourselves how God has spoken to us. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is the Word. The Word which is light in the darkness is because of his love for us that we have life with God, that we're restored back to God because of his sacrifice and his resurrection. And so when we talk to others and we speak to others, when we build others up with our words, it needs to be proficient in Jesus' talk, words of grace and mercy and justice and forgiveness and trying to make God known. And so as we do communion today, we need to be reminded of how we talk, that it would be reflective of the love which God has spoken to us. And so even though we're not passing things out, you have your communion here. Uh, If you're with us today in service, if you're at home, go ahead and grab your elements. If you're here before you do it, if you've never used one of these before, I just want to make sure that you do it correctly. Um, I'm helping you from my mistakes of making a mess the first time I did this. There's actually two things here. There's one which you'll open up and it'll take the wafer. So I would open up the top flap and get the little wafer out. And then once you have the wafer out, I wouldn't do it yet. We're going to take a moment just to pray, but then you could open up the next part, which has the juice. Okay, so get the wafer out first, then open up the juice part, just for helping you out there. Again, learn from my mistakes. Every time we do communion, we always take a moment just to focus our hearts, to think about what God has said to us through his word, to feed on the truth of who God is. And so let's take a moment. Maybe you need to thank God for something. Maybe you need to ask forgiveness. Maybe you need to ask God, God, bring to mind somebody I need to speak to about how I've spoken. God, who is somebody I can affirm and build up? But however you need to respond to him in this moment, let's do that. And we'll say we'll take a, qu- a moment of quiet and then we'll receive communion together. And so God, in this moment, I pray you would speak to us. I pray that you would remind us of what's truth and what we've heard. That we would draw our minds and hearts to the cross. And I pray you would just speak now, God.
Would you stand with me? So God, we come before you as a church family acknowledging your death on the cross, acknowledging the, your broken body that was broken in our place, your shed blood, which forgives us of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We praise you, God, for putting our unrighteousness on yourself so that we can be clothed in your righteousness. We're grateful for your resurrection, that you conquered sin, that you conquered death, that you ushered in new life and have invited us into it. God, help us to speak these truths. Help us to speak and build one another up with the love which you've shown us. Forgive us for the times that we have failed. But God, let us be continually proclaiming you, proclaiming your good word, proclaiming the good news, proclaiming your love and grace for everyone. We ask all of these things in your name. We remember all that you've done. Let's take communion together. is your body broken for us, your blood shed for us. We acknowledge and we're grateful. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You can just hold on to these until the service is over and there's a garbage can in the back just as you leave. But we want to just close in this last song as we think about the life which God has given us, that we would live worthy of that life, that he would build up the truth of who we are in him. And that would come out in how we speak. So let's sing this together.
thinking about this, oh, sorry, that God would fill us and move with us, that we, when we speak toward one another, when we speak to anyone, they would be experiencing the love in the heart of God. So God, I pray that you would help us to watch our words. I pray that we would let us see the opportunities we have to speak to people, the opportunities we have to build people up, to fill them with life, to fill their souls, to nourish them. God, I help, pray that you would help us to take responsibility, that we would walk worthy, that we would take responsibility for the moments we haven't, that you would be known and proclaimed. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Hey everyone, thanks so much for being with us this morning, whether you're here or online. And please come and hang out with us tonight. Uh, if you go to the church's Facebook page or text this number, let us know you want the information. We'll get that to you. But it's just going to be a great time to talk and pray together. And I really hope that you're there. I really want as many people as can. I, our, we need to reconnect. It's been a long summer. It's been a long, it's been a long pandemic. And just to be with one another in that way, uh, I just think it would be a powerful, filling thing for us. And so... Hope to see you there. Uh, if not, have a great rest of the week, and we will see you next Sunday. Thanks, everyone. If you're here on site, just stay where you're at. Gabby is going to come through, and she'll dismiss us. And then you can um, dump your um, communion stuff in the garbage can back there. Uh, remember, you don't have to leave, but make sure you're social distancing as you hang out. <laughs>